is the creator of Vmux and Gitter. Um, somebody started, it was probably him, uh, a Gitter chat room earlier that people have been talking on a little bit, I think. Um, I don't know if he's going to mention that, but uh, hopefully ask him a question about it if he hasn't. Um, he sort of converted from Ruby to JavaScript a year and a half ago, which you guys will love and I as a Rubyist will hate. Um, but he was sort of saw what the NSA had been doing with data and suddenly got quite passionate about adding privacy into conversations and things online. And that's sort of what he's going to talk to you about today. So if we can give a warm welcome to Mario Pompilio. Hi, Rui. Hello, everyone. Um, so first, I'm going to do a, like, a small disclaimer about this, this talk, because I'm going to be talking about cryptography and security. And I'm not a, a professional a cryptographer. So if you see or heard something that I'm saying that is not correct, please, during the Q&A, correct me and tell everyone about it. Because security is like a very complex topic. And it's good like, that we need to share this information. And it's a process. So it's something to have in mind. And if you see something that is not correct, just tell me afterwards. Uh, so my name is Mauro. Um, you can find me on Twitter under that name. By during the day, I, I spend my time working mainly on Git IM, which is a, like, it's a product that we are it's a GitHub integrated chat, so you can use it for chatting with your teams. Or if you have an open source project, you can like, have a public room where everybody can, can join and talk. And the rest of the time, I spend my time working on Vmux, which is a, an in-progress project I'm, I'm developing. Um, this is Alice, my crypto anarchist girlfriend. She actually knows she's a crypto anarchist now because I told her about it. Uh, as you can see, this is a screen capture from uh, a browser. We are having a conversation. And this is my dad. We are having a, he's using his Android phone. We are having a peer-to-peer -peer encrypted end-to-end -end chat. And what's remarkable about this is that they are not a computer experts. Like Alice works with computers. She's a graphic designer. But she's not uh, an engineer like us. She like common people is not aware of cryptography most of the time. And my dad is a plumber as well, so he, his contact with computers is not like the same we have. So I'm going to try to encourage you during this talk to think more about uh, working, and working on services and developing products and services that are more respectful toward, towards the privacy of your users mainly uh, using through the use of encryption and through use of like, more, more like, security-oriented uh, platforms. For those that are not aware with the, with the term, a crypto anarchist is someone that basically uses encryption to, to hide all the, his communications. I guess the, crypto, the, an, the anarchist part comes because of the political like, acceptions of the, of the term. Um, because like we, we live in a quite privileged society here because we can like share our political views like quite freely, but there's people that can't because they live in like different kind of under different kind of governments or oppressive regimes that it, it, you're not you're not allowed to share your your political views freely. So I got interested and in, uh, and my interest in security started growing up more and more since last year when this man, I hope you recognize him, I hope everyone recognizes this man, is Edward Snowden. Um, when he released all the, when he leaked all these documents about the, the questionable practices that the, the five eyes, the so-called five eyes, which is like the American government and the UK government and a few more, um, the practices they are doing about like basically trying to collect all of, all of our traffic on the internet, basically trying to harvest all this data and control and analyze it. And sometimes it's not even legal. And the, the legality of this is quite a, a gray area, because we have, like, we have laws that are supposed to protect 
your privacy and your data, but those laws are bound to a country. And on the internet, we are not like, you, you might be using services anywhere in the world and your traffic might be being routed anywhere. So you're not in control of where your data is being stored, where, what services are you using. Um, someone coined the, like, like last year while this was going on, this was like around May last year, uh, the summer of surveillance, but it was more like the start of like a surveillance aware era where we, through these documents that are being released still today, like it's like so much uh, of this that is being released still today. Um, and basically we, it came to our knowledge that, that these governments, uh, these government agencies run pretty, pretty scary programs. Um, like, for example, Tempora is a program that is being run in the UK. To, it's basically like a three-day buffer of the whole UK traffic that the, the GCHQ keeps um, for analyzing and for to have access to it. And like other programs like Prism that basically are snooping traffic on fiber optics under the ocean. And it's like, sounds kind of like science fiction, but it's a very real thing. Um, so you basically learned that mass global surveillance is not like a, a, from a book or an Orwellian book. It's, it's like a reality. And the problem with this is common people is not, does, doesn't have the same knowledge as us, as engineers, have um, to decide what of their activities are private and what, what, what is not. People like my girlfriend or my dad or uh, your, your mom or anyone expect privacy from things that are not necessarily private. So they expect privacy from uh, sending a Facebook private message to someone else because they assume that it's not on the wall, so they must be private. Or that the, the, your, the plain text emails you receive in your Gmail account or in any um, web, web email service is private. And email is the most insecure thing. Email is just like plain text stored in a disk somewhere. Everybody can, any sysadmin that has the keys to that server can read it. So they are not, all these services are not private at all. So, and how private is like, people think that ephemeral things like a video chat conversation that happens over a period of time and then disappears because it's something you, yeah, I'm having a chat with you, and it's like during last five minutes, and then it's gone. It's not really, because this is, this is a quote, actually, from one of the leaked documents uh, about a program com called Optic Nerve that this GCHQ was running. Uh, and it was taking still images from video chats of all the Yahoo users. Um, Yahoo was not aware of this but they were not encrypting the, the, the video conferences anyway. So people that have access to all of these, the, the lower infrastructure of the internet can easily snoop into these communications. So this, this shows like a, a problem with, uh, an inherent problem with the, with the infrastructure of the internet. We have centralized services, like most of the services we use are completely centralized. You go and reach a server, and then everything is being relayed through that server. Not just like the pages you, you receive when, you, when you're visiting a page, but also most of the services you use are very centralized. There's a huge lack of encryption. There's like, people doesn't take this into account when they develop applications. And I, I think they should more and more. And there's another problem that is trust, because uh, with security, you, you cannot trust something that you don't have access to, that you cannot read. So that's why open source is like a very powerful tool. Um, there are solutions to all these problems. There's like BitMessage, there's PGP, there's off the record chat. You can expose services, you can store your email in a Tor hidden service somewhere. But the problem with this is the same as I said before, like if you tell your dad that you're going to send him an email encrypted in PGP and tell him to generate a key and send the public key, he will be like, what are you talking about? No, 
people can't be bothered to do these things. So where does JavaScript come in, in all of this? Where, where is the position of JavaScript? So I think JavaScript is in a very interesting position. For, and, and that's why I wanted to give this talk to, in the JavaScript conference, because the, the community of JavaScript, well, to start, is like everywhere. So everybody that has access to the internet has a browser that runs JavaScript. So it's like everywhere. And also the community, uh, the JavaScript community today is huge. And it's very, very diverse. There's like people that have been doing JavaScript, front-end JavaScript for years and years, and are like absolute experts, and have a UX kind of eye as well. They, they, can, they, they know how to do applications that are useful and easy to use. And there's also like the new node people that kind of joined over the last years that is like um, more hardcore backend people. So the, this combination is like really interesting. We have like the whole stack end to end can be written in JavaScript. And there's precedent. There's like really interesting apps that have been written in JavaScript and are incredibly useful for a lot of people. One of them is CryptoCat, which is a project by a guy called Nadim Kvesi. And he wrote CryptoCat uh, to communicate safely. CryptoCat is kind of centralized because uses XMPP as a transport. XMPP is the same technology like Google Chat uses. It's, it's a, a messaging platform. Uh, but all the content you send through these services is encrypted on the, on the browser before leaving it. So uses of the record messaging that I showed before. And then there's Mailvelope as well, which uh, allows you to do send encrypted PGP encrypted messages um, using any webmail uh, service. So that, that, that's kind of proof of that JavaScript there's a lot of people that think that JavaScript is not the right tool to, to, to write secure services. But this is kind of a proof that it can evolve. And I hope in the future we'll be like more and more aware of this and it will evolve to, to a more secure environment. So more, almost at the same time that the, the, the leaks were happening and all of that, I discovered kind of at the same time WebRTC. Um, and in my opinion, it's one of the most promising technologies, or like JavaScript prom um, technologies, and one of the most promising ones. And for all those three problems I mentioned, this is kind of like the three solutions we can find in the JavaScript world. So we have WebRTC that will help, that can help you do write decentralized services, peer-to-peer -peer connected services. We have OTRJS, which is of the record implementation in JavaScript, uh, which is an implementation that CryptoCAD uses. And it's like giving an, uh, it's being like, it's not fully audited up today, but there's a lot of security people looking into it. So it's like improving every day. And we have open source, which is like probably one of the most powerful tools we have to write applications on top of these two technologies. And OTR is open source, and WebRTC is open source uh, as well. So I started with a project, which is the one I mentioned before, VMAX, because I, I, I used to use Skype a lot, because I, I'm from Argentina, but I live in London. I live here in Barcelona. I have family here, so I talk with them all the time. I have family living in uh, Argentina as well, so I, I, I talk a lot with people online. Um, but since I learned about this, I was like, this, there has to be something better than, than, than this. We, we should be able to, to have a platform or um, an application that allows people to use, to have secure communications, but at the same time being really easy to use. So like anyone can use it. It's someone that is not a technology expert or an engineer. So this is the main idea. It's like feature-wise, feature it's the same as Skype or Google Hangout, uh, but in the browser, because it's obviously implemented on top of WebRTC. Uh, there are no plugins or Flash, and obviously it's peer-to-peer -peer and uh, open source. The stack as well is, uh, because I, I like a lot of CoffeeScript, 
I like, I like a lot of people, I think, that have been here today. Uh, so I choose Vmax is written in CoffeeScript, like everything back into front end. Uh, the backend is written in Express, which is like it's very, very small because the only thing it does is signaling, which I'm going to show you in a, in a moment. Uh, and then it's backbone for the, back, for the front end, and I'm using Browserify to package everything. How many of you are using Browserify to package your client code? Okay, it's a good, good amount, but you should check it out because it's like a fantastic tool and allows you to write like very concise. Uh, common JS modules that you can like reuse and you can even like put an NPM and then just package them into your into your front end. Um, with Vmax, like Browserify, I'm gonna show you the code quickly because just to show you how we, more or less how the code is structured. Um, so the JavaScript is all you can do like node style requires uh, of your views or your models or everything you have. Uh, and then you, get, you can just export all of those. So for example, here I'm at the top, I'm requiring the, the user model. And the model, the only thing it's doing is this is a user model which basically handles all of the, like a lot of the complexity about the OTR and all that stuff. But at the end, you do just the model exports like you do in a node module. And then you can require that from, from anywhere else in your code. And then when you bundle everything with Browserify, Browserify takes that into account and builds like a single JavaScript file that you then, then you can deploy anywhere. And that's, wait, where is the browser? Yeah. That's very important in this case because uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily want to run JavaScript, sensitive JavaScript code in the browser. The browser is like really and a really insecure platform. So ideally, you will run your JavaScript sandbox somehow. So for example, CryptoCAD is a, a Chrome extension. So Chrome extensions run isolated. Uh, they have access to, to the browser, but the browser cannot access the JavaScript that is running inside the, the sandbox of the Chrome extension. Um, and that way, and the same thing does MailVelope. So MailVelope, when you have a a form where you're going to write uh, an email, a PGP encrypted email, you click on it and you get like a text editor that it, it runs in a different window. That window is running locally. Lo those JavaScript files and that HTML is being loaded locally from the extension itself. So there's no way that someone can like, because with JavaScript, it's working? Okay. With JavaScript, you, like the easier key logger in the world is a on key press event. So anybody can like hook an on key press event on anywhere that you're running on the browser and basically log everything you're saying. So this way you isolate yourself from that. And the same, you can do the same, you can also for example ship a, a node WebKit application where you can just have this bundled JavaScript file that you put in a node WebKit and then it runs isolated in a, in a desktop environment. So uh, I'm going to explain a bit, like demystify a bit WebRTC because everybody knows that it's like peer-to-peer uh, -peer and it's cool, but no one really kind of went deep into how, how it works. So I'm going to try to explain how it works. It's not super complicated. It's like very very simple stuff. So support for WebRTC uh, nowadays you can run in like most of the browsers that modern browsers so on. Chrome for, and Chrome for desktop and Android, and Firefox for desktop and Android. And Opera uh, is fully available. Like the features, there's interop, so you can call, you can have a connection that goes between a Chrome browser and a Firefox browser, or an Opera browser. And there's also like native library. So you will see that uh, WebRTC has a lot of these video and now your functionality, but as well has a really important part that is like the the peer-to-peer -peer data that you can send through devices. So if you need, uh, with Java and Objective-C bindings, you can implement something that is a WebRTC client, but doesn't expose video or audio or media of any kind. It's just like sending and sharing data. Um, so basically, it's three, it's, it, uh, WebRTC is split into three main components. One that allows you to access input devices like your camera and your microphone. Uh, one component that 
coordinates all of the peer-to-peer -peer, like logic. And another one is the one that allows you to send basically arbitrary data. And it's separated in three main APIs. The media stream API, which is the get user media. Uh, someone showed that yesterday capturing the, was the GIF streaming. So that was capturing the camera with the get user media. And what it gives you is basically you can pass constraints to it. So I'll show you quickly. So you can, this is the actual call. So you will do get user media. This is, I'm using an adapter because this is like a polyfill. Some of the APIs are namespaced still. But get user media is a, the JavaScript API. And then you will pass some constraints and then a success and an error callback, basically. Uh, on the constraints, you can pass, you can say if you want audio and video, or you want just uh, audio and you, or video, in the video you can pass the resolutions you want to access, the frame rate you need. Uh, if you're using a mobile device, you can say if you want what camera you want, the user-facing camera or the, the camera that's facing the, the other side. And then on the success callback, you get basically a stream, a blob that you, then you can use, uh, you can put as a source for a video element, for example, you get like video. Um, then the RTC peer connection is the main component. Basically, is the, 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 the WebRTC itself. And it hides a lot of complexity. It has a lot of, that, that's a lot of things for you that are really important. Like the signal processing handles all of the encoding for audio and video when you need to send that uh, to a remote peer. For other users, the, the two codecs, Opus and VP8 are uh, open source and royalty free. Google made them open source and royalty free, which is really cool. Um, and then that's all the security uh, aspects of the communication. I'm going to talk a bit more about that. It, and the RTC data channel, once you establish this link between the two browsers, then you can create a, a data channel between them, which um, is very, very low latency because that's like straight peer-to-peer, -peer. and then has a WebSockets API, which is like super simple. You're going to get code that you're using for WebRTC, uh, for WebSockets, and basically kind of port it to use it with data channels. And it secures the connections using DTLS. But this is still, this is not magic. Like, both browsers still need to discover each other. So you will, you will do, uh, you need a signaling method to send session descriptions. Session descriptions contain information about how, uh, basically about what resources are you exposing, if you're sending audio and video, if you're sending, if it's just a data connection. And it's the, the, the transport you're going to use to send those session descriptions from one browser to the other is uh, completely abstract. It's up to you. You can use WebSockets. You can use server sent events. Uh, you can do XMPP. Uh, there's a lot of people using XMPP for the signaling. Uh, and this is kind of how it looks. You will have like a, a public server that you will use for the signaling. And then once the two browsers exchange candidates, uh, they could, it's called ICE candidates as well because they have information about your IP address where, you are, where the other person can reach you. Uh, when they exchange that information, then they establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection. So the problem with this is that we don't have public IPs for everyone, right? So you're always behind a NAT. A NAT basically allows you to have a lot of computers behind the network and then expose them, all of them going to the internet through a one single IP. And so what, it, what WebRTC does is uses these two technologies. Uh, stand and turn that allow you to, when, you, when your browser tries to connect to a different one, to know what his public IP is, queries the stand server and says, like, what's my public IP? And when does this request, it pierces the port, it opens the port going out. And that information is the information the stand server returns back. So the, the turn server tells you, okay, you're on this public IP and you open this port, the port 40,000, when you went out. Then you put that information in the session description, and you send that to the remote partner. 
and the other server, the other browser, will try to connect to that uh, public IP and that port that is open because you opened it when you did the stand connection. Um, it sends, it's also, all of this happens, it's like isolated in the, inside the, the eyes component of WebRTC uh, that sends, it, it's not just your public IP, it sends like all the IPs uh, that are available. So you will expose your, uh, your local IP on your machine in the local network, and you will also expose the public IP. So if someone can reach you on your private network, then the, the connection will be peer-to-peer, -peer, but will not go out to the internet. It will be established in the local network. Um, this is kind of how it looks. So your peer will go through an app to the stand server, ask for this information, and then send that information through the signaling channel to the other browser. That will do the same, and then you will establish the peer-to-peer -peer connection. And the turn server, which is a, a relay, is what, will you, what you will use in, as a fallback. So if you cannot establish, because you are behind some kind of a, a very restrictive firewall or something, what you will do is uh, get this information, send it. If the other partner cannot, cannot reach you, they will use uh, the turn server to relay all of the, all of the traffic. It's not peer-to-peer -peer anymore. You will need the relay that has to be accessible from both partners, uh, but still encrypted end-to-end, -end because the relay, the only thing it does is relay packets from one machine to the other. It doesn't do any decryption. Can, can't, because the, 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 the TLS uses a self-signed certificate on each side uh, that is contained on the browser. Um, this is kind of like how it works. So the, the, the problem with this is that if you use, you have to be careful how you do your signaling. It has to be secure, the signaling itself. So all, the, all of the encryption for the data channels and for the peer-to-peer -peer connection is handled by a WebRTC. But the signaling, you have to, basically, it's your choice. Uh, and for VMAX, I'm using of the record messaging, which usually is used for uh, instant messaging, because you're sending, like, encrypted messages, but uh, you can authenticate, uh, you can use OTR to authenticate the, the messages you receive through, through the signaling. So if someone sends you uh, uh, an invalid session description that is encrypted, that someone else encrypted, or it's like it's being uh, tampered, you, you will basically discard it and not use it. So if you want to play with this, I really encourage you to play and start using it to build something. Just build something crazy. Uh, PeerJS was mentioned yesterday. Ben did like an amazing demo yesterday. Uh, and there's PeerJS mainly for data. They have media now, so you can do media connections. But it's mainly data. And then there's simple web RTC, and there's a few links. I'm going to share the slides later online. So I will talk about that later. And then there's, this is a lot of projects that are using WebRTC for something for non-conventional video uh, services, be it like video conferencing services. There's ShareFest and ShareDrop that basically allow you to send files peer-to-peer -peer from the browser itself. So basically on ShareFest and ShareDrop is like a clone of uh, AirDrop that you get on the Mac. So when you open it, the interface looks exactly like AirDrop. And then... Uh, working. And then you can share like uh, files through that. WebTorrent is something similar to what uh, someone showed yesterday during the lightning talks. Uh, it's basically a WebTorrent client that runs uh, in the browser over WebRTC. It's a really interesting project. Um, and there's like peer server, which is a server to serve pages, actual pages, from your browser. So when you establish a connection, then you can serve content as if, as if you are a, a web server from your browser itself. The Tor Flash Proxy, Fla Tor is an anonymizer, traffic anonymizer, and they have a Flash Proxy that allows you to basically connect to, because if you, the, the traffic, the Tor traffic can be like censored, like where you are in your, depending on the, your geographical location. And the Flash Proxy allows you to connect to a Tor client uh, remotely through, it used to be through a Flash 
component, but now they are migrating to, towards WebRTC. So they are trying to use WebRTC to have peer-to-peer -peer connections and basically have a, 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 sim a similar routing that they use for Tor on top of WebRTC. So there are a few readings that if you want to start, I, re I really recommend you go through this post because they have a lot of information about everything I explained, but even in more detail. So you will be, with this, you can build like basically anything you want. And there's also like Discuss WebRTC, which is the main Discuss group, uh, uh, the mailing list for WebRTC. Uh, and that's it. Um, basically, I, what I want is like to encourage people to start using these technologies that are amazing and are like on every browser. Every one of you that has a Chrome browser running or a Firefox browser running here can can use it. Uh, and that's it. I have a question related to uh, the Heartbleed bug. You mentioned that uh, open sources are the way we can trust software rather than closed source. What is your take, take on that? <laughs> well, the, the, the thing is, is a, the fact that it's open source doesn't mean that it's secure itself, but at least gives you the chance to go and dig through the code. And the, the thing we helped with is that at least it was discovered and was fixed. If, if Helply was a problem that was in a private and a closed source code, you would, you would not be able to even discover it and even less fix it. So the fact that it was open source, yeah, it was, it was a very critical bug, but at the same time, we managed to evolve. Is that, is that what I said at the start? It's not, you cannot assume that everything is like secure from day zero. Security is like a, a process, and it's, it's, it's in our hands of everyone of, in, the, in this room to go through all this code and check that it's not doing anything malicious. So that's basically the, the, the advantage of, of the open source. There's another one at the front here. Hi. Uh, Hi. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm not, not a big security expert in nothing. I, I don't have that much knowledge. But uh, from what I see, we are, we, what we are trying to do is take out the middleman or make a direct connection between peers. But uh, in our time of mistrust that we have now, we know for sure that uh, like uh, certain certificate of treaties are not that trustworthy. There are injections from governments into the, the, the traffic. Hmm. Is it possible in, in this solution to inject a third peer between the two? Between the, the two, two partners? Yes. No, no, you, well. Because maybe you do you <laughs> communicate really the, the the like you could receive from one part encrypted to the other and take it back yeah. or no? Basically, when you connect, when the two peers connect, uh, yes, when, they, when they first establish the connection, like the actual connection, uh, then they do the DTLS uh, like handshake, and that handshake is exactly how TLS works how SSL works in your browser. But you have to go through a server or something, no? No, no, no. That, that, thing, that handshake is done peer-to-peer -peer itself. They, once they, they manage to establish a, a connection, a TCP connection between them, they do the TLS handshake. OK. So, and at that point, the, you are directly connected to someone but else. Before that, Yeah. so they know about each other, there is a, they go through a server or something or no? It's through the, through the signaling server, yeah. The signaling server sends on these session descriptions, uh, one of the fields it sends is a fingerprint of the certificate you have on your browser that your browser generates for that connection. So you could right? there put a man of the middle attack in middle or not? No, because if you send a malicious, a malicious fingerprint or a, a fingerprint that is like tampered, you can modify that and, you, and then you can send it to the other browser. But then when they connect, the handshake will be invalid because you, your browser will verify the fingerprint against no, I was the other thinking, browser. I was thinking more about tunneling. So I get a fingerprint of you. If you use a tunnel. I, it, I yeah, if you use a relay. I'm, I'd really, because I, I don't I know see, at I'm, that level if you can I do something on the relay. 
I see like money. a missing link or there is this missing component that you have always to trust at some point, at some point the server or the, the central lines of internet to, to give you that trustworthiness that normally you, that you still need some kind of physical access or something to, I don't know. If, uh, if you understand me, what I'm, what I'm. Yeah, I can. Uh, if, if you want, I can show like in detail more or less how it works. But this sounds once, like a, a good opportunity yeah, for yeah, yeah. After, uh, after a after conversation coffee, over coffee. I think. Go, go through it. Yeah. Um, that's all we've got time for. Don't rush off because we're about to do the raffle. But let's give Mama a big uh, round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>